I think we found this yesterday. Everybody does such amazing stuff that if we center on introductions, we don't get to the real stuff here. So let me introduce Aram here. Uh, Aram Sinreich is a professor and he's the chair of the Communication Studies Division at American University's School for Communications. Um, Aram and I went to college together. And so we've been, we've been, we've been arguing about music for decades. With love. With love, mostly. No, fully, fully. <laughs> um, Sinreich's work focuses on the intersection of culture, law, and technology. For those students of mine, this is when I hold up the book Mashed Up, or you have questions about copyright law, I always send you to him. Um, he gives emphasis to subjects such as surveillance, critical data studies, intellectual property, remix culture, and music. His books, Mashed Up in 2001, The Piracy Crusade, 2013, The Essential Guide to Intellectual Property, 2019, and his forthcoming book is called The Secret Life of Data. And somehow amid all that, he wrote a novel under a pseudonym, right? Yeah, it happened. So, um, so I'd like to, Aaron will run the discussion, Dania Best, Aaron Myers, Jamie Duffy, uh, welcome them. I'm still not, oh, and thanks to Steve Waxman for setting up uh, what I think is gonna be a great conversation. Uh, so less about me and more about these amazing people. I uh, probably shouldn't admit this given that we're at a Catholic Jesuit institution, but I'm an inveterate atheist. Uh, but I think that the people who are on this panel have been doing God's work. I am so blown away by, uh, by the initiatives uh, that these people have taken on to make sure that local music ecosystems are thriving in the wake of our multiple compound crises that we've been facing in recent years. Um, so I'll ask each of you to introduce yourselves uh, and talk about uh, specifically about the initiative that you've been working with, uh, Dunia, the out, our, the out of Our Shells project, Aaron, the DMV uh, Stakeholders Alliance. I probably misnamed it. I apologize for that. Uh, and Jamie, uh, Youth on Record. Uh, and then once you've briefly introduced yourselves, we can jump right into it. Uh, Dunia, why don't you start out? Okay, my name is Dunia Best. Um, we started uh, Out of Our Shells as a mobile recording studio to find people around the DMV area who hadn't done anything during the pandemic or maybe in the last 20 years. My, my real goal was to find the uh, in, insular classical composer who hasn't had the orchestra to you know, perform their work. And we kind of found them. Um, so that was, that was really fun. And uh, we're hoping to expand that to other cities. Great, Aaron? I'm Aaron Myers. I'm a jazz a vocalist and pianist. Uh, and I think predominantly during the pandemic, uh, helped to organize the DMV Music Stakeholders here in Washington, DC. That thank you very much. <laughs> Something that uh, really helped bring not only musicians, presenters, art administrators, nonprofit people, and then also those who are somewhat enthusiasts and policy folks who are interested in sharing resources and understanding how we could support one another during the pandemic around uh, uh, various different uh, spaces, uh, ranging from policy initiatives to uh, financial support, gigging, making those things better. Uh, so that's, I think, mainly for this discussion what uh, I would be talking about in a sense. Thank you. Is this on? Great. Uh, my name is Jamie Duffy, and I'm the longtime executive director of Youth on Record. So we are located in Denver, Colorado, and the heart center of our work is creative youth development and success. So within that work, we're working with 3,000 young creatives and scholars ages 11 to 24. We teach programs in the schools, and those are taught by professional local musicians. And then we... Um, have built a young creative ecosystem. And we're really um, looking at that ecosystem as an opportunity to develop the next generation of creative, of the creative workforce, but also to take cues from that ecosystem um, 
you know, and suggestions and integrate them into the larger music ecosystem. Um, we also recently purchased and are now the co-owners of Denver's largest music festival, the Underground Music Showcase. Um, and so that is a mission aligned investment for us. And then we are incubating a music and entertainment company for social good. Great, thank you so much. I told you they're all doing God's work. Um, so it seems to me that whenever we talk about local music scenes and ecosystems, we, we end up talking about two very different things at the same time. One is about how music bonds together communities. And that music can take place in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nightclub, but it can also take place in a church, on a street corner, uh, in any number of kind of communitarian environments. And that serves an important function of tying people together. At the same time, you have a local class of professional musicians who need to get paid because their next rent check depends on their next gig. Um, so when we saw these ecosystems torn apart in the wake of uh, COVID with some help from the global economic and ecological crises that we're facing, um, both of those got torn apart. So I guess my opening question for you is when you're building a ground level grassroots musical ecosystem organization, are you thinking about replacing people's income first or are you thinking about tying together community first and how do you negotiate the tensions between those two? I think it's, it's important to know your community first um, because those things cannot, it's, it's, it's not even a rock in a hard place. You can't do one without the other. You have to do both at the, at the same time. So for instance, with the BMV Music Stakeholders, the first thing you realized was that we knew gigging musicians who, would, who literally live from gig to gig. So when they said, we're shutting down everything, I immediately, I myself included, knew 15 people offhand that I could name who would not be able to eat by the weekend. So we needed to be able to put money in hands first, and we knew who those people were because I knew my, commu my community. And so what would be an ongoing sustaining model to be able to keep money going into their pockets? And that's something that I knew that from the private sector, we did not have a relationship with for as musicians. The clubs that we would go to with, for support also just lost a huge chunk of revenue. So they were no longer an option. So you needed to turn to the government to be able to you know, defend and protect and all that good stuff they say they're supposed to do for us, right? So that was the option that we needed to turn to and we needed to shape the policy, write the policy, do exactly what the lobbyists do, walk in with the legislation that you needed written, walk in with the support you knew you needed written and identified. A lot of times we don't, we, we ambiguously ask for support or help. Like if you, if someone had a lot of money and they said, how much money do you need? You would have to think, you have to pause, you have to wonder what is that? No, you need to know specifically what do we need for help? And when you specifically say, hey, this is what I need, this is what the community need, and you pin that to paper, put that on, you codify it. When you're going to the people who can write the policy to support you, you're then equipped with what you need to have the support and you just may get it. And if you get it, these people now have the support they need to survive and to live. Jamie? Yeah, I would say, you know, our through line throughout the pandemic was actually the number one thing in the music ecosystem model, which is systems of learning. And we never stopped doing that throughout the pandemic, right? So it was important for us to understand that we were going to get out and get through it. And so um, our teaching artists who are all professional local musicians and our young creative coaches who are also professional local musicians actually transitioned to virtual systems of learning faster than our school districts because we're smaller, right? And so we were able to continue those systems of learning, but our approach is integrated. Um, part of the reason that we employ 90% of our staff are musicians. And so we are able to offer this through line of salaried work um, that you receive full benefits, including mental health stipends, your cell phones paid for. So our first focus was systems of learning and then the care, support, and financial security of the musicians who work for us. And so we were able to continue to, you know, provide salaries. We were continue, were able to continue to do that work while encouraging 
um, our artists to continue to create as much as possible. So we created opportunities where they could come record at our studio under very safe COVID precautions, but we control our own studio. Um, and so, you know, for us, the, the through line of how artists are going to make their money, um, we are looking at a very sort of intersectional dynamic approach here that you, that, um, as my friend, uh, Ben Chavez says, like, we're, we really do encourage a diversify the hustle, right? Like, but so that you don't have to hustle as much. And so as much as we can employ musicians to do really good work in the community while incentivizing space to create, um, that's, that's been our approach to financial security before, through, and after the pandemic. Dania, um, the Out of Our Shells project um, wasn't focused on paying musicians, but instead defraying the costs of, of producing music. Do you want to talk a little bit about yeah, sure. Works. I mean, part of what we were looking at was the fact that a lot of people didn't have the money or, or the resources to record their music. So our idea of bringing the recording studio to them was really about, you know, getting into communities that may, may not know how to, you, you know, maybe you, you've got like 10 great songs, but you know, how, how are you gonna get those songs out there? So we were very fortunate to be able to work with a, like a really high level professional engineer who was willing to donate his time and come around with us and meet these people, develop their project and, and record a song for them that they could eventually sell. So, I mean, I think ours was both, both community and financial. A lot of the people were just, you know, jumping off with their projects or like, you know, shifted to this after their job fell through, you know, type of thing. So it, it was a good thing. Um, in the spirit of the event, I don't wanna only focus on money and industry. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, community dimension of the ecosystems. Uh, it seems to me one of the th themes that I've heard uh, in all the conversations so far, and just that I think we've all experienced in our own uh, personal and professional lives, is that in a way, the, um, the, the total shutdown and then reemergence of musical ecosystems presents new opportunities to rewire the way that ecosystems work. And one of the, the, the principal themes that I've heard uh, coming out of these conversations is that we got so, previous to, to COVID, we got so siloed and so stultified and so caught within genre and format and style. And you know, we began to think of music as being something that separated us from one another rather than uniting us. And so many of these new initiatives are about bringing together people from different areas, different backgrounds, different styles of music. Do you, do you think that there's an opportunity right now as we rebuild these uh, ecosystem institutions to build a better musical community, one that's more uh, inclusive and that does away with some of those silos? Well, one of the things that I've noticed even before the pandemic with the advent of the internet is all of the micro communities that came out of all the different kinds of music. Like maybe you like, maybe you like ska music, but do you, you know, ska music from Mexico city, you know, very specific, like, you know, very like a, you're with like a punk edge or, you know, but the thing about it is that you can dive into that wherever you are in the world now. And I think that that really upends a lot of the music industries you know, and I, I always say, I always say genre is racism because the music industry basically made these things, and especially in the United States, to separate people out. And I think that it's a very democratic thing that's happened. The fact that we all had to go online and we all had to kind of find our way through. And I, I, I think it upends all of that completely. Um. <laughs> I would say that if we don't take this opportunity, we deserve exactly what we get. Sure. Because I mean, that's, that deserves a clap, that's fine. Uh, like literally, like we were able to, I remember the week that the shutdown was, I, the week the shutdown happened, I was scheduled to go to um, Normandy, France. I was supposed to do uh, uh, the Mars Jazz Festival. And the organizer said, we can't do it. You know, you're gonna have to stay. And I felt, well, I said, no, I, I don't want to do it. I'm going to stay. France is on fire, no need to be there. 
And um, at that point, I called some other artists who were, I would say, big time. Uh, are, are you canceling your stuff? And oh, no, we're not canceling. I felt like I was nobody. It's like, I'm not strong. I don't have a strong enough base and infrastructure behind me to keep this thing going. And by that Friday, everybody was grounded. So I'm like, okay, it, it really brought us all to the same freaking level. And then it forced us to stay at that level. I had to go to therapy to learn how to, I'd forgotten how to rehearse and practice for me. Every, all my practice time had gone toward practicing for a gig or for a show or for something I'm trying to write. I'd forgotten what it was like, just the joy of the piano practice. I had to go to therapy to learn what it took to do that all over again. I'm glad you did. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And so with that being said, with us coming all together, at least with the DMV Music stakeholders, it gave us opportunity to listen. I, as an artist, I had never sympathized with a, a business owner. As, uh, as business owners, never had an opportunity to sympathize with art administrators. For me, I never had an opportunity to really understand the real plight of festival presenters, you know, or, this, or those who work in support of music, the stage and, you know, the, the sound and what they were all going through. It gave us a time to not just for a week or two understand each other's problems, for almost a year hearing these things out and then seeing the similarities and then finding some solutions. If we stop doing that now, just because we can get out there and so and so work for less money in many cases, for worse conditions in many cases, going back into the same problems we compa complained about on the bandstand beforehand, we are stupid unless if we do not find a way to do something different and, and reimagine what we want normal to be, not a new normal, what normal should be because the normal was we were being mistreated and the industry was not on par with technology, with, uh, with the 21st century to begin with. So I think we should, I think this is the opportunity that we should do the hard work of continuing that. I know sometimes we don't have as many people on our calls, but we have to keep the calls going. We have to be comfortable in doing the unsexy work of this business you know, and re reimagining, especially as musicians, there's no reason all of us as artists don't have our own companies by now. So we can know that we can, we can do this in a better fashion because we are small businesses, but we're not doing our sole proprietorships the right way. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So there's some things we could be doing to make this thing a, a reality and, and really to do, our, do ourselves uh, better than what we've been doing before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Eugene? Yeah, um, to the first point about, you know, where we're going in terms of genre and, and all of these sort of possible like cultural changes we're seeing. I mean, we have to give credit to where credit's due and that's Gen Z and young millennials who have come in and are pushing for um, a less sort of binary industry culture way of thinking. Like they are the ones who are pushing us on every aspect of that they you know um we're sort of catching on to like oh maybe like genre doesn't matter they've been saying that for 10 years since they were six years old and and understood that we're more expansive than we've given ourselves credit for so in, in a lot of regards we can't even begin to imagine the new industry without centering creative youth development like if if you you know, my encouragement is that as we are looking at the future of all of this, if you are doing your work and there are not, and you are not partnered with a creative youth development organization and young creatives, like you aren't going to get it right. It, it, there's just absolutely no way because no matter what, you're building either for a moment six months ago, six years ago, but you're not building for 10 years from now. And if we're not building for 10 years from now, it's already over. And so, you know, some of the ways that we, we have in practice started to do this within our youth development is that is always at the center. So our purchase of the music festival was so that we could imagine the future of the music festival industry but build a pipeline for our young creatives now so they can start working there now. And I just didn't want to ask permission. I mean, that's why we bought it. You know, like I was like, I don't want to ask for, for permission to partner. I just, I can't do that anymore. So we should just own it. 
you know? And so, but the, the, the impetus for that was the future of work and the future of labor that is not commodified. And so, you know, uh, that is always our starting point um, and will always be our starting point, you know? And, and that means the long haul. I mean, we have our young creatives who started with us at the beginning who are our employees and parents and almost in their thirties now, you know? And so you've got to stay the long course. These generations change, you know, pretty quickly. Um, but you've got to stay the long course and, and partner with CYD organizations all the time, um, and universities. So, uh, we're down to about three minutes, which means about one minute left for each of you. I know it's such a great conversation. I want to have it all day, but uh, I guess we'll enjoy it from, from the room. Um, it, it, one year from now, what is one change that you would like to see in the music ecosystem that you inhabit? Uh, and what do you plan to do to help move things in that direction? I can start and then we can end with you. Um, the change I want to see is for all of us to orient ourselves around um, getting out of sort of the binary of for-profit, nonprofit, and start to understand that some of the work we need to do is earned revenue. Some of this work the government has to support. Some of this work, a lot of this work philanthropy has to support in order for us to truly provide pathways, thriving wages. Um, so getting out of our own constructs of you're the for-profit, you're the nonprofit, um, and really uh, starting to partner and envision the middle lane. Um, I think uh, that is the best way. The reason I like to do that is I just like to get the money from every place to do the work. And so we have to stop constraining where those flows of income are. Um, so that's what I want to see in a year. That's You'll see that in our music festival this year in the first, you know, we bought it in two months. We raised um, $65,000 from philanthropic funds for the music festival. So we plan to double that next year. I think I heard the young man say this yesterday and something I thought about a great deal. Um, I, a year from now, I hope that local musicians in DC, most local musicians are global musicians. Okay, local musicians are touring musicians, they travel the world, the music is everywhere. So I hope in a year's time that uh, imposter syndrome is just eliminated. You know your greatness, you know who you are as an artist, you know. And then what I would do to help in that is to not only promote, but try to introduce systems and things to my fellow colleagues that will help them help them uh, i guess you uh, to take their power back as a, as an artist and a musician i think that's all I, I i can can do it took years for me to actually and many if you're an artist and a performing artist i know i i've written in in uh, my book that about an hour before every performance i'm tempted to, to cancel it because i don't think anybody's going to enjoy it and i think that they're going to catch on that i'm an imposter that I ought not be there. Um, and then I get through it and it's a great show and all the anxiety and the sickness I felt has gone away. Um, so it is my hope and prayer that a year from now, those who are in DC, especially in jazz, will understand that we are badass, we are good, we sound good, people want to hear us. There are more people who have not heard of you than have. So you have an audience to introduce yourself to and you should strive toward meeting that particular audience. That's my goal, at least. I'm laughing because last Saturday I was on the phone with him in England going, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> like, She's about to trip. headline a festival. <laughs> <laughs> um, a year from now, wow. I really want to never see another Taylor Swift style debacle again. I don't think I don't think one person should be absorbing everybody's monies like that. I think it's very strange. And I think it really needs to be diversified and spread out for everybody. There's no reason one person should be like, I don't know, sucking it all up. <laughs> so what do you? Ticketmaster, really. But I, I never want to see that again. I never want to see anything like that again. 
No, it's not her. It's yeah. them. They, they, they've ruined it for everybody. You know what I mean? They've made I mean, it how terrible we, for us. How are we going to make that happen? How are we going to make that happen? Wow. You, I know. Break up the merge. It's like just de demonopolize. I mean, it's come on, It's insane that the those uh that space music right that oh. one <laughs> the, the greatest the greatest platform of all time Free one birthday. one person owning all the music venues in we're I mean that that has to stop it just has to stop great um well uh big round of applause for this amazing panel thank you so much to Ben for inviting us to uh, have this conversation and I'll pass it back to you Great, thank you. Our, the third in our three right here um, is going to bring us from these local initiatives um, to a wider frame right here. I'm really excited to introduce uh, Dr. Michael Seaman. He's an assistant professor and assistant director of Colorado State University's arts management program. Michael's work examines issues in the creative economy most recently, the economic, cultural, and social impact of music venues. The New York Times, Washington Post, Wa uh, Wall Street Journal, National Public Radio, CNN, and regional media outlets often seek Michael's perspective and insights. Uh, we appreciated them yesterday during our intensive as well. His work is published uh, across many academic journals, edited volumes, uh, City Lab, and most recently by the Brookings Institution. He's co-authored music and film strategies and creative economy reports for the city of Denver and the state of Colorado. And joining Michael here, Sean Watterson, who is the president and co-owner of the Happy Dog, which is a neighborhood corner bar, popular place, um, and live music venue located in Cleveland's Gordon Square Arts District. Some Cleveland fans. And he spearheaded um, the effort in Ohio on behalf of NEVA, the National Independent Venue Association to save our stages, $18 billion. Sean joined the fund, Our Economic Future in January, 2022 as a senior consultant working on hospitality sector recovery initiative. Specifically, he's focused on efforts to improve the quality of and the interest in frontline hospitality sector jobs in Northeast Ohio. This work includes both large employers and small businesses, and it's done with an eye towards making the jobs and businesses sustainable in the long term. Welcome, Sean and Michael. Hello. So uh, the last couple of years, uh, I've been immersed in trying to prove the point that we all know that music venues are more than just places to see live music. Uh, they have social impacts, they have community impacts, and economic impacts. Uh, one thing that it, it keeps coming up uh, during my research with several different venues uh, all over the country is the fact that they're employment generators. Uh, I find you know, people um, incubating, learning how to be businessmen, women, um, and also uh, think of a band as a, a small business. They learn how to be performers and continue on and, and sometimes become cottage industries. But this is often something that just isn't really thought of when we look at music venues. And in the spirit of, you know, COVID was a terrible situation, but it highlighted a lot of these insights uh, to the national stage. Well, when you didn't have music venues open, all of a sudden you realize, oh, it's more than just seeing music. This is where my son or daughter, you know, gained a career. With that thinking and the thinking of, let's not rebuild, but reimagine, uh, how can we reimagine music venues as employment generators? So I'd like to bring someone who owns a venue and see what your thoughts are. Yeah. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, COVID, COVID was a, was a wonderful disaster. Uh, Aaron's point about bringing people together and actually understanding from each other's perspectives how interconnected the system is was really important. And it was also important that our communities saw what was missing when we weren't there 
Uh, one of the things that worked the best for Neva in our advocacy was a study out of Chicago, the loop study that showed that for every dollar spent on a ticket to a live music event, it generates $12 in economic activity in the immediate surrounding area. Um, what, what I've had the good fortune over this last year of doing uh, is working at an economic development think tank called the Fund for Economic Future. And what I'm seeing there is the systems that exist, not in our industry, but in manufacturing, healthcare, and IT around workforce development, um, that's where those dollars were, were focused because the thought by local leaders and, and federal leaders were those were good jobs. And our sector never got those dollars because our sector was considered not good jobs. But the reality is our sector is one of the biggest employment sectors. And when I say our, I mean hospitality broadly, including arts, entertainment, and leisure in, in the country. I know in my city, it's the third largest employment sector. It's almost as big, big as manufacturing. So where I see, where I see a path forward, uh, and, and this is to Jamie's point about putting aside the distinctions between for-profits and not-for-profits, is in workforce development, federal workforce development dollars to help us in all different aspects of our ecosystem. You know, we focus on the creatives because the musicians are the one on the stage, but it's the sound techs who are making them sound good. And it's the lighting techs who are lighting them up. And it's the front of house manager that's making sure the bar is selling enough alcohol to fund the whole operation because we all know that's how we run. Um, so, so I see a real opportunity and an un, a gradual understanding by those in, in the workforce development world broadly, that there is a need to invest in, in our sector. Yeah, abs absolutely. And in, in the research that I've, I've been doing for the past several years, it's fascinating just how many people like you know, the bands, the tech people, but then I've met people that, you know, they, they started booking shows at all ages DIY venues, and then they end up having their own promotions company, where the graphic designer that's doing posters for their friends, all of a sudden gets a job at a venue and then goes on to a production company or promoter to do many, 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 many flyers. And what's interesting is, uh, you know, with the, the looking at cultural or creative activity and employment, and when it was suddenly gone, you know, we started talking about big federal programs. Um, you know, how can we like workforce, um, uh, the One Arts in the federal workforce, WPA, uh, SETA in the 70s through the Nixon administration. How now can we look at the federal government? Is, are there programs that and, and that could help venues? And how could you integrate a venue within a workforce program? Well, that's our challenge. Because what I've seen in workforce development is in these other sectors, there are intermediaries that have developed, that, that develop the training or the apprenticeship programs. And these are all terms of art within the workforce development world. Um, and those providers or those intermediaries are working with the employers, they're working with the youth, and they're working with the community colleges and universities, but also the schools, because you're, you're accessing that pipeline really from high school through um, two-year degrees, through certificate programs, right up, right up to four-year four -year de degree programs. Um, what's different and what's, I think, been a challenge for those in the workforce development world is they have traditionally viewed workforce development as something that gives somebody a career, a job that's going to give them a paycheck and benefits for decades. And our industry is different than that. Uh, a lot of what we do is really paths to entrepreneurship. I know at the Happy Dog, we have five alumni businesses, our staff who have gone on to open a music venue, uh, another music venue down in Florida, and three restaurants. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm really proud of that. When people come and work at the Happy Dog, I tell them, I want this to be your last job in hospitality because either you stay because you love it, at the happy dog, you decide 
hospitality is not for you, in which case we will try and help you get a job somewhere else, or you start your own business. And I think for workforce development people, understanding that, that what we do is a path to entrepreneurship is, is a concept that we have to sell them on. Uh, they don't inherently understand that. Um, it's, it's a lot of overcoming negative perceptions. But I think one of, the, one of the things that this could really help us with is I, what I see in workforce development is a real focus on BIPOC youth in these programs. If we are able to develop the training and the apprenticeship programs, if we either turn to places like the Neva Foundation to develop some of this programming, to music, local music incubators. Um, there's a great music incubator that just launched in Wichita called Midtopia that uh, Adam and Jesse Hartke run. We have one in Cleveland called Cleveland Rocks, past, present, and future. Um, these, are all, these are all vehicles to develop that training and to standardize sort of the apprenticeship program to then work with the, the clubs. And um, really, that is a way to diversify management and leadership in the clubs, because we are getting funds to train people who don't look like me and Michael. Um, but because we are a pathway to entrepreneurship, that's where I see uh, the greatest path forward to diverse, diversify ownership of our clubs. So. Um, I think there is real potential, and and uh, one other thing that I that I really like about this is um, a lot of the the conflict between for profits and non not for profits, especially leading into Save Our Stages was arts and culture were nonprofit organizations, and they had a scarcity mentality around funding because there's not a lot of that kind of funding. When we all got together as NEVA and, and rallied the support of all of our supporters and, and music fans and artists, we saw that we were approaching it not from a position of scarcity, but a, a, a more is better approach. And that's how we got the largest arts funding bill in the history of the country. Um, it's still inherent in some of these nonprofit institutions, especially the older ones, that, that that scarcity mentality exists. But if we're looking for more federal dollars, these workforce development dollars go to anybody who's paid. And it doesn't matter whether they're paid by a nonprofit or a for-profit small business. So um, to me, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to partner with, with some of our arts and culture partners uh, and access funding in a way that, that we were able to with Save Our Stages. Um, and it sets aside kind of that old paradigm of arts and culture is high arts and we're commerce. Right, right, absolutely. And you know, I love Neva. And you know, again, the pandemic was terrible. What, what a great thing to come out of it. Uh, what's next? I mean, could workforce development be something that Neva you know, addresses at a national, you know, the federal level, you know, being that we're in DC where everything happens. Can you speculate on that? I, I think, I think, you know, I've spent a year trying to immerse myself in this workforce development world. I see this as, as a potential opportunity, but more of us need to be involved in this. Um, Neva, we've met with Americans for the Arts, and we see a common, we, we see common interest there because we're coming at it from the perspective of venues. So, so we have lots of jobs to fill, mm -hmm. but there, there are workforce development opportunities for artists and organizations like Americans for the Arts can help with that. And the crossover points are going to be our music incubators. Um, so I think there, there's lots of opportunity, but there's lots of getting up to speed on, right, on our right. end to be able to take advantage of these opportunities, but they're there. So we need to do it. Cool. 
Uh, one thing that's near and dear to my heart is uh, all ages DIY venues, uh, because when when you are interested in music, the most visceral connection is probably between 15 and maybe 19, uh, and then you're hooked and you've got a great uh, life in front of you. In terms of, you know, and the other thing with that saying, uh, I've had many, many experiences playing house shows, DIY venues and such, and I'm always impressed by how savvy and hardworking the the younger generation is within these venues. Um, do you at all see a way that you can connect the people that are under 21 with venues to kind of, uh, kind of like a minor league to help set them up for careers once they turn 21 within uh, venues? Yeah, I think um, I, music incubators are a great space to do it. I think it's incumbent on the venue community um, to reach out to to the folks doing youth development, not just creative artist development, but but career development in all of the other aspects. Uh, what I've seen in in Cleveland is we're probably closer to success in the film Ooh. segment than oh. in, in the music segment because we've got we've got a film studio that that is very focused on on high school and post high school uh black youth it's a black filmmaker who's moved back to cleveland and uh really understands that it's not it's not developing writers and directors and editors it's developing grips and best boys and and all of the production that's necessary for any of that that work that that's happening and Ohio is a place that has a film tax credit. So, right. so there's, there's a base there. Some of the things I think we can look at is our, our music production uh, tax credits. That's mm. something we've looked at in Ohio. Um, but I think we need to think broadly when we're thinking policy um, to say, Hey, we're an industry in every way we can, we can give youth opportunities to have careers in this, industry not in just a, a segment of the right. industry um is going to make the industry and the ecosystem healthier great great yeah i it, always tell my students you know if you're looking at anything in the creative industries think holistically you know it, it's very easy to get a corridor of knowledge where you are you know you, you have blinders on but you can learn from film you can apply that to music and you can learn from you know, students that are 17 years old and apply that to shows that attract 45 to 55 year olds. Yeah. I, I would say too, you know, the reality of the music community, you know, three quarters of our staff are working musicians. Mm. Um, we actually commissioned a photographer uh, probably eight years ago now to take a series of photographs of our staff on stage and then our staff doing their job, working the door, working behind the bar, emptying the trash, and set the exhibit up with those two pictures side by side of each of those individuals, because that's the reality of the local music ecosystem. Yeah, so true. Um, you know, people don't just survive on, on making and performing their music. They survive because there's an ecosystem there. Our folks can go out on tour and come back and know they have a job because somebody else is going to go out on tour. So, right. um, yeah, excellent. Yeah best industry in the world i love it yeah. <laughs> okay especially if you like hot dogs and beer oh uh, yeah That's... exactly yeah it's either that or my early baseball yeah. um so uh we open the floor for questions uh sir and something that i was thinking about when you brought up diy related venues is you know, maybe this is just because i live in washington dc and got very much by Harbor for discord and i all ages shows but you know Something I've thought a lot about, especially in the context of jazz venues, is what are we going to decouple almost the necessity of alcohol? Mm -hmm. It just seems like it gets in the way of the ecosystem when you have people who are blocked, but they're not old enough for just that that necessity of you're at live music, so alcohol must be part of it. Just has mm -hmm. run to me the wrong way as a person myself. Yeah, I. I would love to discover the revenue model that makes that <laughs> possible. I mean, and, and we're seeing, especially, you know, Ohio is not a, a legal weed state, but uh, that said, 
we've seen an increase in mocktails mm. as opposed to cocktails. Like I think people's habits are changing. Um, but I would, I would love to find a model that didn't rely primarily on the margins you make on, on alcohol sales. But I don't know what that is without, without additional supports or without increasing the cost. And if you increase the cost, you decrease the access. Um, I know right before the pandemic, the Department of Labor had the apprenticeships. Uh, we can use it in an actual principal industry, and it had not been so. And then during the pandemic, we saw that musicians uh, get unemployment, so it's an insurable type of industry. Are you working, are you all working toward that end to see if we can keep that trend going forward? Or is there work being done around? I, I would I would love to see work being done around that in the position I'm in. Uh, it's a hospitality sector recovery initiative. So I'm focused much more on working with the venues and the restaurants and the bars um, and hotels on that aspect of it. But that's why I was saying the more we can partner with groups like Americans for the Arts and others who are focused on musicians as a career as opposed to support for performers as a career um i think we can we can access those dollars because some of the people who are going to be providing that training and those apprenticeships are going to be are going to have feet in both worlds and this is where i'm thinking locally on the ground these music incubators and we're seeing an increase in the number of these incubators and philanthropic support in creating them. I know the one in Wichita uh, has big philanthropic support. Um, whether, whether we see broader support from, from public arts funding, uh, we'll see. I mean, we have to be our own advocates on that. All right, we have time for one more question, ma'am. Thank you. I don't need, but thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm here in the, uh, the, I am the executive director of a nonprofit here in DC, but I'm also a steering committee member of Music Workers Alliance in New York. Music Workers Alliance has been doing the work to get all of this money, like insurance and everything from, uh, for musicians, but also for music workers. Those, those people that are doing all the behind the scenes and then the people that are just, you know, doing the ticketing, everything. So my question, I wanted to state that so that I'm, I'm around and I want to talk to folks because I'm not talking today. Mm -hmm. But the, the second question is really big, and I don't know if we'll ever have time to really discuss it, but how do we decouple capitalism as a structure from the music scene and this, this system because it's always going to be inherently biased towards certain people. So is there, a, is there a future or are we thinking about how to actually create that future that it's not top down, but across? Sorry, I know. No, I'm not a sociologist. <laughs> I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, it, I hate the word monetization because it's it it takes you away from it takes you away from the thing that in, that's inspiring about music, but it's a reality. So we live in this capital capitalist system. So we we need to make things work within that system. I would say there there are efforts to try and and decentralize and and demonopolize. Um, Happy Dog. We're part of a new booking collaborative called Detour. Um, which is an affiliation of independent music venues and promoters across the country. We're, you know, we're a year into it, not even a year into it, trying to, trying to make it work, especially for the artists who value playing in independent rooms. Um, that said, they still have to make, the tour has to work for them. It can't be, it can't be pure, uh, goodness of their heart kind of thing, it still has to work. But I think there's a there's an understanding, uh, you know, part of the, the motivation with Detour is each of us in our markets really understand our market. So we understand what room is the best room. And we're not trying to, to make every last dollar. We're trying to get things in the right rooms 
uh, in front of the right audience so that it works. So I think, I think that spirit's there, uh, but it's hard. The system's not set up to make that work, but the system wasn't set up for us to get $16 billion and we got it. And there's a traces of this in the, the nationwide DIY underground that, you know, the hope is in the future and with Gen Z and such, and even just in my playing and such, I've seen the shift in that a more trading economy as opposed to a, a cash based one. But thank you for the question. It was awesome. Thank you for all your questions. And thank you for coming out. And thank you, sir. Thank you. And we shall conclude. Thank you, Michael. I just want to pick up on your last point and make a suggestion. How about we hijack capitalism? How about we hijack the structures and get in there? That's what we're doing. Um, I want to thank everybody who participated in here to be able to go from the 19th century and see how people hustled back then to move to now, to visions of the future, to local, to national, to global is, is really helpful. To me, it's helpful because it allows us to see that the structures we have aren't logical structures. They're the product of all the good actors and bad actors we've had throughout history. So uh, I wanna thank Steve Waxman for kicking us off. I wanna thank Aram Sinreich, Dania Best, Aaron Myers, Jamie Duffy, Michael Seaman, Sean Watterson for kicking this off. We have 15 minutes.